It is good to be with all of you tonight. I hope you're doing well this week. If you have any updates to our prayer concerns, I hope you'll get in touch. Give me a call or send an email. Please also remember that we are continuing to meet for worship every Lord's Day at 9 a.m. So please be sure to sign up online using the Sign Up Genius account. This would be a great time to do that while you're thinking about it. And if the 9 a.m. service fills up, we are then replaying the 9 a.m. service at 10.30 a.m. Uh, at the church building using the projector. So if you need any help signing up, if you have any questions about that, get in touch with me or with Kenna. We'd be glad to help you out with that. If you're listening by phone tonight, and if you need any help with this, if you have anything that we need to be praying about, I hope you'll give me a call at 608-224-0274. In terms of good news, I am thankful that we seem to have vastly improved the audio quality tonight. Last week, I taught this class from my standing desk, my new desk here in my office or my study, we might say. And when I listened to it on the laptop last Wednesday, it sounded really good. It sounded great. And so I uploaded it to YouTube. However, when we listened to it together with all of you last Wednesday night, the audio was absolutely terrible. It sounded like thunder in the background. What in the world? There was this low rumble in there and just sounded really, really bad. And it was somewhat better when we turned off the sound bar on the television. Uh, the cheaper speakers are better, apparently. Uh, but when we looked into it, we got a much better microphone. We ordered that right away. I think that got here last Friday or so, and then we looked into it, we did some testing, and we discovered that where I am standing here, the vent from our house's HVAC system was pointed directly at the microphone. So I put my hand up to the microphone to adjust it, and there was a breeze on my hand. Microphones do not like wind. <laughs> And I had positioned the mic directly in the path of that vent. And so tonight I have turned off the circulating fan on our furnace. You know that we heat with wood, but we let that fan circulate to keep the air moving throughout the rest of the house. And so I've turned that off tonight. And we also have the much better microphone. And I'm hoping that the audio for tonight's class is much better than it was last week. I've also learned to test the audio uh, not using the speakers on my laptop as I have in the past, but using some high-quality studio headphones, headphones where you can hear stuff like wind that comes across as a kind of thunder or very ominous storm coming up during class. But uh, let me know if it's any better for you tonight. But from my point of view, it is a, a significant improvement over what we had last week. I have a special request of all of you tonight. We are coming up on a year uh, having Bible classes online only like this on Wednesday evening, coming up toward the end of March, I believe it is, will be a year. Some of us have not seen each other for nearly a year, and that is not okay. That, that has been very rough for some of us. And so that we can at least see each other, I'm wondering whether you might be willing to share a picture of you and your family watching the live stream, either on Sunday or on Wednesday. Uh, but I would like to share these on Wednesday night during this time together briefly at the beginning of each class. If possible, get yourselves in the picture with the device that you normally watch in the background with uh, something on the screen that we would uh, recognize as being the Four Lakes live stream. Uh, this is a picture I took of Tabitha several weeks ago when she was home for the winter break. Uh, by the way, both Tabitha and the dog gave me permission to share this picture with you tonight. So I am thankful for their permission in sharing this. But if you could get you and your family in a picture like this and email it to me at the email address there, fourlakeschurch at gmail.com, I would really appreciate it. And if at all possible, I would love to share one every Wednesday, maybe. I don't know. This may be the only one you see. I don't know if people will participate in that or not, but... Uh, I would really appreciate it, and I think that'll be at least one more way of us keeping up with each other. And let's use this as a reminder that all of us are still here. And uh, I know we see the numbers, we see how many people are watching the live stream each week, uh, but I think there would be a value to all of us at least being able to see each other in some way. You're probably thankful I can't look into your living room and see you right now, and I know I can't, but uh, uh, let's see if we can share some of these, and I, I would love to pass these along, And I, but I need your help in that. I, I would greatly appreciate it. Tonight we get back to our study of the book of Luke, and by way of review, in case you might be joining us for the first time, we know Luke is a Gentile. He's a medical doctor. He writes both Luke and Acts to a man by the name of Theophilus. He makes a point of writing in chronological order. It is a well-researched account. He apparently interviews eyewitnesses and includes some of their testimony in his writing. 
He also includes a number of people who are often overlooked or oppressed in the ancient world, including women and Gentiles and widows and Samaritans, as well as the sick and the poor. And once again, the Harmony of the Gospels will be very helpful tonight. These are available on Amazon for around 25 bucks. We also have one in the church library. I happened to stop by the church building yesterday with my dad and uh, did a little cleaning and rearranging around there a little bit. And uh, I noticed that uh, there, the one is still there. So we have a Harmony of the Gospels in the church library. And uh, that one was donated in memory of Walt Smith. And so if you want to check it out before you go buy one of your own, uh, that would certainly be a, a good possibility there where you could research that yourself and uh, make an informed decision. Last week, if you were with us, you may remember we made it through the Lord's crucifixion and then his burial. We looked at the last three hours on the cross. We noted the darkness fell on the land from noon until 3 p.m. We then saw Jesus die about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And then we saw Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus step forward to claim the Lord's body. Uh, we saw them bury the body. Then we saw the Jewish leaders uh, come to Pilate with a special concern that the disciples would steal the body. And so Pilate then gives orders that the grave be sealed, secured, and guarded through the third day. And the reason for this is the Jewish leaders remembered that Jesus had said that he would rise again on the third day. And they wanted to make sure that that did not happen. So tonight we pick up with uh, the text. And before we get to Luke, we have a few verses in Matthew and Mark that we would insert here. In Matthew and Mark, we have a record of Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, both visiting the tomb together as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week. And Mark also includes a woman by the name of Salome. They bring spices for the Lord's body, but when they get to the tomb, they find that an earthquake has occurred and there's an angel sitting on top of the stone that's been rolled away and the guards are shaking and they become like dead men. And I would just point out that all of this happens very quickly in time sequence and there's some overlap from this passage in Matthew, the passage in Mark, and also in Luke and John. It's very quick and there's some overlap there, something maybe in one account that's not in the others and vice versa. So it's a bit difficult to line these accounts up perfectly side by side in parallel fashion. Uh, but with this, let's go over to Luke, and let's look at Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 8. And that'll be our first section from Luke tonight. Luke 24, verses 1 through 8. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again, and they remembered his words." So what we're reading about here takes place right around sunrise on the first day of the week as they come to the tomb bringing spices. Well, the they is defined in Matthew and Mark that we just looked at as being Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and also Salome. Uh, what I notice here is that these women are not expecting Jesus to be alive, are they? They don't come here expecting to see the empty tomb. Remember, the Jewish leaders were anticipating something. The chief priests and the scribes, they, they were worried or they were anticipating some event happening. That's why they talked to Pilate. That's why they sealed the tomb. That's why they posted the soldiers, the guard. But these women, the Lord's most faithful followers, really were not expecting Jesus to come back. And I say that because they bring spices. In other words, they have come to finish preparing the body. If you remember, Jesus was put in the tomb right at sunset on Friday. They couldn't do this kind of thing on the Sabbath, and Sabbath started at sundown on Friday evening, and so they've now come back on Sunday morning, the first day of the week. And Mark specifically tells us that this happens after the Sabbath was over, maybe emphasizing the work aspect of this. This is something they could not have done on the Sabbath legally, according to God's law. Now, as they enter the tomb, they find the body of Jesus is not there, and now they see two men standing nearby in dazzling apparel. Matthew and Mark only tell us about one man. Luke mentions two. Matthew refers to an angel of the Lord, and so we assume that these two men are angels. And the natural reaction to seeing an angel 
is what we find elsewhere in scripture. The women are terrified and they bow down with their faces to the ground. In response, these men or these angels, they say, why do you seek the living one among the dead? And that's a good question. He's not here, they say, but he has risen. And then they remind the women what the Lord had said previously, that he would be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise again. So they kind of give a mild correction in the form of a reminder. He told you this would happen, and now it has happened just as he said it would happen. And in verse 8, they remembered his word. So that's kind of how this paragraph ends and goes into the next one. They are remembering what Jesus said. In Matthew and Mark, the angel tells them to go quickly and to tell Peter and the other disciples about this and that they need to go meet him up in Galilee, up north of here. Uh, Matthew tells us that they listen and go, but Mark says that they are gripped with fear and say nothing, at least for a short time, at least right away. There is at least a little pause here. And if true, uh, this news is almost too good to be true. This, this can't be happening. And so they process this for a minute. It's also a bit terrifying to think that Jesus has actually come back from the dead. This would change everything. If this is true, uh, this is absolutely amazing. So they remember the Lord's words and they process this information. And that's where we pick up with verse 9. So let's look now at Luke 24 verses 9 through 12. Luke 24, verses 9 through 12. They remembered his words and returned from the tomb and reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now they were Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James. Also the other women with them were telling these things to the apostles. But these words appeared to them as nonsense and they would not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen wrappings only, and he went away to his home, marveling at what had happened. And so here, the women do come back from the tomb. They explain these things to the eleven. Remember, Judas is dead at this point, so we're down to eleven apostles. I would also point out that sometimes when the Bible refers to the twelve or the eleven, they're not talking necessarily about a literal number of people in the room at that moment, but they were talking about the group. And so the 12 would refer to the 12 apostles. If one of them happened to leave for a few minutes to go get something, they were still the 12, even though there were 11 in the room. But now that Judas is definitely gone, it seems that in this time between the Lord's resurrection and the beginning of the church, they were still known uh, as the 11. So that was kind of their, their group name, we might say. And so we also have a number of, uh, of women here, and they come in here and they are explaining these things to the 11. So Judas is gone. We're down to 11 apostles. We've got Joanna, a number of other women. We also need to remember that the women are the ones who stuck with Jesus throughout the crucifixion. They were standing at a distance, but they were there, even as the other disciples had all already run away. So the women are the ones with the courage. And they're the ones then given the privilege of being the first to tell the others about the resurrection. That, that is just an amazing blessing, being able to tell the apostles uh, what has happened. That's, what, uh, that's the position that they're in. However, when the women come and talk to them, talk to the apostles, the apostles don't believe it, do they? This, no, no this, is, this does not make sense. They've got to go see for themselves. Uh, Luke tells us that Peter runs to the tomb. He looks in. He sees only the linen wrappings. He goes home marveling at what had happened. Interestingly, John gives us a little bit more information. John tells us that Peter sets off running, but the other disciple joins in and actually runs faster than Peter, and the other disciple gets to the tomb first. And most people assume that John is the other disciple. That's why he's not named. He's being humble in that sense, not putting his name here. And so, in a way, John seems to be bragging in Scripture that he is a faster runner than Peter. Of course, he does it without using his name, but to me, that is really funny. And so, he, he writes that in the Word of God that he, the Apostle John, uh, can run faster than Peter does. Uh, when they get to the tomb, although John gets there first because he's an awesome runner and Peter isn't, uh, Peter is the one who actually goes first into the tomb to check it out. And that certainly keeps with what we know about Peter and his personality being impulsive and all of that. So Peter leaves first. John catches up, overtakes him, gets to the tomb first. Peter then finally makes his way to the tomb. 
and they probably look at each other and, hey, what's going on here? And Peter is the one who jumps up and uh, goes in the tomb to look first. In the tomb, he finds the linen wrappings and the face cloth, but the face cloth is not with the linen wrappings, and that's interesting. But instead, the face cloth is off to the side, rolled up in a place by itself. Some have suggested that this was the custom among those in the trades, uh, that they had a, a handkerchief or a bandana, we might say today, for wiping sweat. And whenever the job was done, they would roll it up or fold it up neatly as a way of saying, this job is now done. So I'm folding up my, my bandana. This I'm moving on to the next mission here. Well, I can't verify that. I've heard it from some of you. I've read it elsewhere, but it's interesting. At least we can get out of this. Jesus, he doesn't leave things in a mess here, but he does some rearranging on his way out. Jesus brings order out of chaos. And this would indicate this is premeditated. This is intentional. This has been thought through. And remember, Joseph and Nicodemus had basically, we would say, embalmed Jesus. They wrapped him in linen wrappings along with close to 100 pounds of myrrh and aloe. This would have been a sticky mess. Even if somebody was alive and completely healthy, it would have been a challenge to get out of this. Uh, but Jesus did, and he left it not in a mess, but in an orderly manner. I would also point out that neatly folded grave clothes would seem to contradict somebody stealing the body in the middle of the night. If you're stealing a body, would you unwrap it? Especially if those wrappings were covered in nearly 100 pounds of what is basically tree sap. It's basically what it is. So if we're stealing a body, do we, do we remove all that? No, you just you'd get in there and you'd take the body and run. Certainly you wouldn't take the time to fold up those clothes on the way out, escaping from these Roman soldiers who have been ordered to make sure this doesn't happen. Um, so I'm just pointing this out as an interesting side note that uh, there is order here. This is not evidence of a body being stolen. At the end of John's account of this, John himself finally goes into the tomb with Peter, and he points out even at this moment in the empty tomb, they still do not understand the scripture that Jesus would rise again from the dead. Isn't that amazing? The two most famous, the strongest apostles, Peter and John, are standing inside the empty tomb and they don't get it on the first day of the week at sunrise. And they just don't understand what's going on here. And so they leave the tomb and these two men go home. In the harmony, we now have Jesus' appearance to Mary Magdalene. This is one of my favorite paragraphs anywhere in the Bible. This is John 20, 11 through 18. A couple verses referring to it in Mark 16. But Mary Magdalene, of course, was the woman Jesus had cast seven demons out of. She comes to the garden. She is weeping. She's sobbing, doesn't know what to make of things. And, and a man she assumes to be the gardener comes and says to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she says, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. There's a little bit of back and forth there. And finally, Jesus says, Mary. And she then turns and says in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Mary then hugs him, uh, wraps herself around his feet, and then goes and tells the other disciples that she has now personally seen the Lord. Over in Matthew, we have Jesus appearing to some other women, and he reminds them to tell the others to go and meet him up in Galilee. So they now have not only the report of the empty tomb, uh, now they have actually seen Jesus with their own eyes. And in the harmony, by this time, the soldiers had come back into the city. They report to the chief priest about all that had happened. And I find it interesting that these are apparently Roman soldiers. They were assigned by Pilate. These aren't Jewish soldiers. These are Roman soldiers. But they do not report back to Pilate. They report instead to the chief priest. Why is that? Personally, it seems to me that they're hoping for more of an explanation. And so this is something they could not explain. They were told to guard this tomb to make sure that the disciples did not steal this body. That's not what happened. These guys saw what happened. There was an angel, miraculous, rolled the stone away. The dead guy came out and he was shining and he left and nobody's going to believe that. And so instead of reporting that to Pilate, which is a death sentence for them, they take it instead to the chief priest first. And these soldiers tell the chief priest everything that had happened. And that's amazing to me. 
the scribes and the chief priests, the Sanhedrin, they get eyewitness testimony from the soldiers themselves who saw the resurrection happen. And they refuse to believe, but instead they get involved in a cover-up. And in response, when they get together with the elders, they give these soldiers a large sum of money. And they tell them that if they are pressed on it, they are simply to say, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And again, this is worthy of death, falling asleep on duty. But it's really the only explanation that would make sense to anybody. And if this gets back to the governor, the chief priest promised they, we, they will win him over. They'll keep these men out of trouble. And that's the story that was circulated and told among the Jews to this day, as Matthew puts it, uh, at the time he wrote the book of Matthew. So now we pick up back with the book of Luke. We're in Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 24. Luke 24, 13 through 24. Uh, this is a larger paragraph, so we'll split it into a few chunks. This is the first section, so Luke 24, 13 through 24. And behold, two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things which had taken place. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him, and he said to them, What are these words that you are exchanging with one another as you are walking? And they stood still, looking sad. One of them, named Cleopas, answered and said to him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which have happened here in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, The things about Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word in the sight of God and all the people, and how the chief priest and our elders delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, it is the third day since these things happened. But also some women among us amazed us. When they were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just exactly as the women also had said, but him they did not see. So we have two random disciples on their way to Emmaus on the day of the Lord's resurrection. It's about seven miles, Luke says, and as they're talking about these things, Jesus shows up and he joins them along the road and he's walking with them. He kind of catches up to them and they're now going together, but they don't know it's Jesus yet. Their eyes are prevented from recognizing him. So there's some miraculous camouflage going on here. And Jesus just joins in on the conversation. And at that point, these men, they stop right there in the middle of the road and they're sad and they're overwhelmed, and, and they're almost shocked that this man joining them on the road may perhaps be the only person in Jerusalem who doesn't know what's going on. In other words, everybody knows what has happened with the crucifixion. This is a public of all public events. This is the most public thing that's ever happened. Everybody knows about this. Well, Jesus wants to know more. No, you know, tell me more. And so they tell the story of Jesus the Nazarene, a mighty prophet. And I would just add here, they do not refer to him at this point as being the Messiah. Why is that? Because the Messiah wasn't supposed to be killed. And so in my mind, they, they almost demote him from Messiah. He was a great prophet. And so there's a little confusion there as to who he really was. So this mighty prophet was crucified. The man who tells the story is a man by the name of Cleopas. He's obviously disappointed and dejected at what happens here. We were all hoping that Jesus was the one, the Messiah, the one who was going to redeem Israel, but now he's gone. And it's been three days and something's up. We've got these reports from a few women that his body's not in the tomb. Word's getting out that he's been seen alive, but we personally, we haven't seen him yet. And so it seems as if they're feeling a little bit left out. Before we pick up with the rest of the story, I want to just briefly point out, as we did a week or two ago, that when a name is mentioned in scripture like this, there may be a reason for it. I mean, there are no wasted words in the Bible. So when Luke names one of these men as Cleopas, especially when he names one but not the other. That's a little, that's really unusual. So there's really, there's something going on here. There may be a reason for that. And so when Luke names one of them, it's possible that Theophilus, the first reader of this book, might have known this man. In other words, oh, Cleopas. Yeah, I could talk to him. I could ask him some questions. And so either that, or even if he didn't know him personally, Luke probably names him as a witness 
so that if Theophilus ever wanted to learn more, he could go back to this man who's named here and he could check it out himself. This is not a made-up story. And so Dr. Luke, the, the physician, uh, he is footnoting his paper and he's putting this, this is in the end notes or whatever. And, and if you want to know more, talk to this guy named Cleopas, or it could have been, like I said, he might've known him. Oh, Cleopas, the elder at my congregation or something uh, to that effect. But the point is he's documenting this names are listed. These are not made up places and names. Uh, these are real people. All right, let's pick up with the next little section as Jesus speaks up. So this is Luke 24 verses 25 through 35. Luke 24 verses 25 through 35. And he said to them, O foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself and all the scriptures. And they approached the village where they were going, and he acted as though he were going farther. But they urged him, saying, Stay with us, for it is getting toward evening, and the day is now nearly over. So we went in to stay with them. When he had reclined at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it. And breaking it, he began giving it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to one another, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? And they got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found gathered together the eleven and those who were with them, saying, The Lord has really risen and has appeared to Simon. They began to relate their experiences on the road and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of the bread. In the first few verses here, notice Jesus gives these men a Bible lesson, doesn't he? He starts with the scriptures. He brings them up to speed from the word of God, reminding them that all of these things had to happen in order to fulfill the scriptures. Look it up, he's saying. And as they're almost to Emmaus, Jesus pretends to be going further. I'm just, I'm going to keep on going. But they insist that he stop and spend the night with them. And sometimes I wonder, what if these men had not invited this stranger into their home. Imagine what they would have missed out on. But for those of us who follow Jesus, we're the kind of people who do things like this for others. We are the kind of people who feed strangers. It's what our Lord taught us. And this is what they do. Jesus takes the bread, he blesses it, he breaks it. And at that moment, their eyes are open and they recognize Jesus for who he really is. And as soon as that happens, the Lord vanishes from their sight. In hindsight, of course, as is pointed out here, they knew it all along. Their hearts were burning within them. They knew it. And so in their excitement, they turn around and they go right back to Jerusalem to tell the 11, remember the remaining apostles. And remember, they had told Jesus to come in and stay with them because the day is nearly over. So let's think about the timeline here for a second. The day's nearly over. They bring in this stranger. They eat a meal together, or at least they break bread together, and then Jesus disappears. They understand who the Lord is. He vanishes. Then they go back to Jerusalem seven miles away. So if we think about that in terms of the timeline, I'm guessing that they're traveling in the dark for at least part of this trip, right? But it was that important. By the way, when is the last time any of us walked seven miles? Very occasionally, I will walk to Farm and Fleet in Verona from my house down Nesbitt Road and, and down Maple Grove and all that. And that walk is around seven miles round trip. It takes me about an hour each direction. So I've just, it's an excuse to get out there in nature. I need something for farm and fleet. I'm going to go walk and get it. So three and a half miles each direction, about an hour each way. And I'm just pointing out that they have already made that journey once on this day. They've already traveled seven miles. And now they are turning back and going back at night. So these two men will have walked at least 14 miles by the time this day is over. It's that important. The same account is summarized very briefly in Mark in only two verses. Before we move on, I would just briefly mention that the two men mentioned Jesus appearing to Simon, and I've always thought Simon was one of the eleven, and he was. So it's a little strange. I'm not exactly sure what's going on here. It seems strange to me that these two disciples are telling Simon that Jesus appeared to Simon. Uh, let me know if you figure it out. Uh, we do have a reference to this by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15.5. Paul mentions that Jesus appeared to Cephas. And I think the harmony brings in 1 Corinthians 15.5 
as a parallel account here, but I think it goes back to the 11, uh, not necessarily always referring to a literal number, but it was the group. And so maybe that's what's going on here. But uh, I think the point of all of this is Jesus appeared to quite a few people on the first day, on, on the day of his resurrection. And the day is not over yet. So we're going to pick up with the next paragraph. This is our last section tonight. So Luke 24, verses 36 through 43. Luke 24, 36 through 43. While they were telling these things, he himself stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought that they were seeing a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they still could not believe it because of their joy and amazement, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of a broiled fish, and he took it and ate it before them. According to John's account, this happens on the evening on the day of the Lord's resurrection, on the first day of the week, so that fits into our timeline. Uh, John also says that the doors were shut where the apostles were due to their fear of the Jews. And so they've locked themselves in some kind of room, terrified that the Jewish leadership will come for them next. They've already murdered Jesus, now they're next in line perhaps, and so they lock themselves in this room. Here in Luke's account is the two disciples from the road to Emmaus are telling their story, Jesus appears in their midst. Remember, they're locked in a room together, terrified, but somehow Jesus stands in their midst among them. And I think that explains why they're so afraid and thought they were seeing a spirit. If I'm scared, and if I've locked myself in a room, and somebody appears in the room who wasn't in the room when I first locked the doors, that's a problem, isn't it? And that seems to be what's going on here. In Matthew, Jesus gets on them a little bit. He rebukes them for their unbelief. Uh, we have a hint of that here, asking about their doubts. And in response to their doubts, Jesus invites them to look at his hands and his feet. Uh, John includes his side, uh, presumably the spear wound. So he is not a spirit. Something is different, uh, but this is not a ghost. This is Jesus in his resurrected body. Uh, Luke then makes sure to tell us that Jesus eats a piece of broiled fish. And I suppose he might have been hungry. This could have been filling a need. But to me, it seems to be maybe proving that he's not a, a spirit of some kind. He's, he's the same fish-eating Jesus that they've been with for the past three and a half years. John's account gives a bit more information, including the reminder that Thomas was not present that night. Uh, once they catch up with Thomas, they tell him what he missed. We have seen the Lord. And Thomas says, unless I shall see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And this seems to be a good place to pause. Everything that we've studied tonight takes place on the day of the Lord's resurrection. Josh Yancey will be teaching for the next two weeks, uh, going back to the book of Hebrews. And so Josh is suggesting that we reread the first six chapters of Hebrews before we come to class next week. And then three weeks from tonight, on March 3rd, I hope we can finish the book of Luke together. And if the Lord wills, this means that we will not only finish Luke, of course, uh, but we will also finish what has been pretty much a verse-by-verse -verse study of the entire Bible here at the Four Lakes Congregation, spanning nearly 21 years. Uh, personally, next week, after Election Day, I've got to work the election on Tuesday, but uh, the next day I hope to... Uh, drive up north and do some winter camping north of Duluth along Lake Superior for a few days. And um, on that trip, I will do my best not to die. It, it would be a shame at my funeral for somebody to have to say, here lies a man who taught the entire Bible cover to cover except for 10 verses. That'd be a terrible thing, wouldn't it? And so I really hope to be back with you to cover the last 10 verses of the book of Luke in a few weeks. But uh, the next two Wednesdays, Josh will be teaching us from the book of Hebrews. Uh, thank you for being with us tonight, either online or on the phone. Uh, be sure to send me any prayer requests so I can get those in the bulletin. And be sure, again, to sign up online for worship this coming Lord's Day. Again, we'll have the one service at 9 a.m. And then if needed, we'll replay that service on the projector at 1030 
And uh, please also remember, if, if at all possible, if you could send me a picture of you or somebody in your family in front of whatever device you watch class or uh, Sunday worship on, I would really appreciate that. I'd love to include that uh, in our Wednesday class here and there over the next several weeks. Uh, as we close, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the God of life, the only true living God. You alone are the only God with the power to raise the dead. Thank you for Jesus, and thank you for your patience with us, especially when we are slow to understand, like those disciples on the road to Emmaus and like the apostles themselves. Even when we've been told again and again and again, sometimes due to human weakness, we are slow to understand. Thank you, Father, for loving us and for being so patient with us. Your Son's resurrection means absolutely everything to us. We pray that we would always live like it, turning away from sin, turning others toward you and the forgiveness that you offer. Thank you for making us a part of your family, your kingdom, the church. We come to you tonight in the name of Jesus, our Savior and our King. Amen.